Now this evening, I want to read to you two verses from the Gospel of John. The first one, John chapter 4 and verse 14. <clears throat> John 4 and 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Then the next one from John chapter 7 and verse 38 and 39. John 7, 38 and 39. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now from these two verses, I want to lift up two expressions. In him, a spring of water. Out of him, streams or rivers of living water. Now John tells us in chapter 7 and verse 39 that the figure, water, was definitely used by our Lord to speak of the Holy Spirit. Now apply that to the rest of this gospel and you find in John chapter 3 we are told of being born of water and of the Spirit. And I believe the implication there is being born of the Spirit. Water, again standing for the Spirit in that context. And then in John chapter 4, speaking about the water that he was to give, which is to become a spring in each one, that too speaks of the Holy Spirit. And then in John chapter 7, explicitly he states that the rivers of living water represent the Spirit. The indwelling Spirit and the outflowing Spirit. In him a spring of water, out of him streams of water. Did you notice that here our Lord very clearly tells us a very important truth concerning the Holy Spirit and his work? There are so many signs and so many other works of power that can be attributed to the Holy Spirit. But his main work is what he does in us. As someone has said, the Holy Spirit is God where it matters most. That is, in our inmost beings. God at work in us. This is the main work of the Holy Spirit. That is why our Lord said, He who believes in me, out of his inmost being, shall flow rivers of living water. Now that is where you and I are often most powerless. We control sometimes our actions and we also try to conquer our environment. But when it comes to the depths of our being, that is where we are powerless. Our emotions, our attitudes, our reactions and our responses. And that is where we often cry out and say, Oh, wretched man that I am. I seem to be completely helpless right here in my inmost being to be the master of my own self. And that is where the Holy Spirit is at work. In him, a spring of water. Out of him, streams of living water. Then we also notice that the Holy Spirit manifests his activity in us and through us in various ways. If you read the book of Acts, a book where we are promised the power of the Spirit, as we find in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, then if you look through that book, you will notice there were occasions when the Holy Spirit worked in miraculous power. You think of Peter and his great preaching and the signs that were done through him. You think of Paul and his preaching and the signs that were done through him. Sometimes we get the understanding that the Holy Spirit is seen only in such spectacular works of power. And the moment we hear the expression power and associate it with the Holy Spirit, we think immediately in terms of the spectacular, the miraculous. But we should also notice that in the book of Acts there are other characters if I may use this expression, lesser characters. Those who appear on the stage and then disappear. 
those to whom no great sermons have been attributed, those who did not write any epistles that are given to us here. And they too had the power of the Spirit. They too were men of the Spirit. And if we look at their lives, you find that the Holy Spirit and His power were manifested in their experience, not in so many spectacular things, but in the ordinary day-to-day -day act of living and serving. And I want to choose one such person to place before us this evening. Someone in whom the Spirit of God was a spring, and out of whom he flowed as a stream. And this is Philip. Philip. There are only three chapters where you read about Philip in the book of Acts, and in all of Scripture. You read about him in Acts chapter 6, you read about him in Acts chapter 8, and you read about him in Acts chapter 21, and then he makes the exit. Why have I chosen Philip? The reason is for us to know that the Holy Spirit's power need not always be manifested through the spectacular. Story is told of a divine in the Church of England in the early days. And it seems that this man used to be very active as he stood on the pulpit and preached. He had all the gestures and he was very loud in his voice as he preached. But then something happened after some time. There was more depth and more power in his ministry, but he was very quiet. And someone asked him, what has happened? He said, the Holy Spirit has dealt with me and I have come to know him in a new way. And now I have discovered that it is not the thunder that has the power, but it's the lightning. And so I have decided to thunder less and lighten more. It is not in boisterousness that you see the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is not in loud speaking or great activity on a pulpit or on a platform that you can identify the Holy Spirit. He can be identified and his power can be noticed even in the ordinary business of living and serving. That is why I have chosen Philip. And when we think of the power of the Spirit, we notice that this power essentially makes us to be all that God wants us to be. And it makes us do all that God wants us to do. The power of the Holy Spirit will not make me to do what His purpose does not intend me to do. God does not make all of us pulpit preachers or platform speakers or workers of great miracles. If His purpose is for you to be a housewife, if his purpose is for you to be an office worker and to be a witness and a blessing in his name, his power will make you to be just that. His power will not make me to be what his purpose does not intend me to be. So the power to be what God wants me to be, the power to do what he wants me to do, and the power to endure all that God wants me to endure. <clears throat> that is what you notice in the life of Philip. All right, here we see him in three chapters in three distinct circumstances. The first one we notice in Acts chapter 6, and I call it a very difficult circumstance. So we find the power of the Spirit in difficult circumstances. What do we notice here about Philip? We find this in verse 3, 4, and 5. <coughs> Let me read this for you. Therefore, brethren... Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip. Now we are not told here very distinctly that Philip was full of the spirit, but we can assume it because of what we have read in verse 3. The men who were chosen were men full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And so Philip certainly must have been a man full of the Spirit. And that is a very interesting expression, the expression full of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that Philip was constantly in a condition of being full of the Spirit. It speaks of a condition. It speaks of a particular relationship he had to the Holy Spirit. There is a lot of misunderstanding about these words, being filled with the Spirit or being full of the Spirit. 
We think sometimes that the Holy Spirit is something like air or some kind of a substance or something like water. And all that we have to do is just to empty ourselves and keep ourselves as an empty vessel and here he comes in to occupy space. Now that is not the idea at all. The Holy Spirit is not a substance. He is not like ether. He is not water. He is a person and I am a person. How can one person fill another person? How can one person be full of another person? Suppose here is a man, let's call him John. Now I keep talking about John all the time and my thoughts and my actions revolve around John and John is always my reference point and I'm not able to do anything apart from John. John has such a control and domination over my life. You can say, oh, Theodore Williams is full of John. And that is true because John is completely in control of my life. Now that is the understanding here. The Holy Spirit directs me, leads me, and He is the one to whom I go for wisdom and counsel, and all of my life is under His leadership, under His control. Then it can be said that I am full of the Holy Spirit. So a spirit-filled life is a spirit-controlled life. Philip, as we see him here, was under the control of the Holy Spirit, was full of the Holy Spirit. His thoughts, his emotions, and all of his personality was under the rule and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now he is introduced to us here in a certain situation. Look at Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists, that is the Greek-speaking Jews, murmured against the Hebrews, the Aramaic-speaking Jews, the sons of the soil, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Here were two groups in the Jerusalem church. Both were racially the same, but culturally and perhaps linguistically different. And so there came between them a barrier. One group was in leadership, and naturally, the other group felt insecure. So they felt their widows were neglected. And there were problems in relationship, problems in fellowship. We sometimes think the early church had no problems. But you notice here, right early in the history of the church, there was the problem of strife and division based on culture and language. There were two groups, two parties. And there was murmuring. Now in a situation such as that, it is very difficult to maintain neutrality. One group or the other will come to you and will talk to you. The group that is against the pastor, against the minister, or the group that is for the minister. They will come and they would talk to you. And they would pour out their grievances, their criticisms. And you listen. And you listen sympathetically. And very soon you get emotionally involved. And the problem in relationships is a real problem today in our churches, in our prayer groups, in our fellowship groups. And if you have not had this in your Christian life, I tell you that you are something special. That is why someone has said, to live in heaven, ab heaven above with the saints that we love is glory. But to live with the saints that we know on earth below is another story. <laughs> and how true it is. And in many cases, the real test of the Christian life comes in relationships. Now normally, how do we react in, when problems come in relationships? The emotion takes over. Here are a group of people who come to me and talk to me about the other group in the church. I listen to them, I sympathize with them, very soon my emotions are involved. And most of our actions are under the direction of our emotions. You receive a letter and you're all stirred up and you immediately want to sit down and write a reply. Your emotion dictates the reply. Someone says something to you, immediately you want to say something back to him and your emotion dictates the word to be said. And we are often under the control of our emotions. They have a powerful part in our life and they control our actions. But you know, here is where the Holy Spirit helps. Did you notice in the writings of Paul, the place he gives to the mind? Colossians 3 and chap uh, chapter 3 and verse 2, set your mind on things above. Philippians 2 and verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Romans 12 and verse 2 talks about the renewed mind. What does this tell us? 
In our Christian life, the secret of victory is to be under the control of the mind. But is the mind in itself enough? No. It should be the mind that was in Christ Jesus. The mind that is set on the Spirit, as we read in Romans chapter 8. The mind that is renewed. Here is where the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit controls my mind, and the spirit control mind controls my emotions, and then my actions are what they should be. Now what, what do we see about Philip here in this problem? When there was murmuring, when there was discontent, here was a man who was full of the spirit along with six others. You cannot be full of murmuring and full of the spirit at the same time. You either have to be under the control of discontent and murmuring, or you have to be under the control of the spirit. And the Holy Spirit manifested his power in Philip's life at this point by helping him to be under the control of the spirit so that he was free from discontent, free from murmur murmuring. So instead of being a part of the problem in the church, he provided a solution. There are some people today who become a part of the problem in any fellowship and in any difficulty in relationships. But oh, to be under the control of the spirit and to place your emotions under the control of the spirit and the spirit control mind. That is an area where the Holy Spirit helps. In him a spring of life. Yes, the spirit within him took control of him at this time in a very difficult situation. I wonder if your problem is constantly to be defeated, to be oversensitive and touchy and to react emotionally in human relationships. You need the help of the Holy Spirit and he is able to take charge of the mind and then the emotions and help you to react and to respond in the way in which you ought to. Sometimes when there is a difficult relationship to be handled, how wonderful it is to open our mind and heart to the spirit and not to be under the control of our emotions. When there is a committee meeting, a business meeting, where a problem is being discussed, which is very close to you and you're afraid of being emotionally involved in this and even of emotional explosion. And then to pray a quiet prayer and to say, Lord, right here in this business meeting, let me be under the control of your spirit and not under the control of my emotions. That, my friends, is the practical way in which the Holy Spirit helps us. But then we move on to another situation, and I call it the depressing situation. And you find this in chapter 8 of Acts. Let me read to you verse 1, <clears throat> Acts 8 and verse 1. Saul was consenting to his death, and on that day a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. All these Christians who were in Jerusalem were suddenly scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And I'm sure Philip must have had his home in Jerusalem. Probably he had his nest built very comfortably in Jerusalem. And this nest was disturbed. And he along with others was scattered. And he had to travel around. Imagine what kind of an upset this would have cost him. When you and I are disturbed from our nests, our plans are disturbed and we have to get away from the place where we have settled very much how disturbing it is, how emotionally disturbing it is. And what did Philip do? <clears throat> and what did these other believers do? Perhaps if you and I were in that place, we would have gone around speaking about the great persecution that took place in Jerusalem. You know, there, nowadays it is very popular to speak about our trials and our afflictions and the wonderful experiences that God has given. And Philip could have done this. He could have gone around talking about the great persecutions and the great suffering. And he could have tried to win the sympathy of people. But instead, what did he do? He and the others, verse 4, now those who were scattered, went about preaching the word. Not their experiences, not their sufferings, not their afflictions. They went about preaching the word. And verse 5, Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Philip was in a very depressing situation. He was disturbed. His home was disturbed. And he had to leave all that he had in Jerusalem and go out 
and wherever he went he went out spilling Jesus Christ what spills out of you when you are tilted is what is filling you and this is very true a nurse had to deal with a very difficult patient in a hospital every time she went to him he was mean to her rude to her and talked badly to her and she just didn't want to see him she went to the Christian doctor and complained about this and the doctor said next time you go to him why don't you take this as a challenge you are a Christian you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord whenever he says anything to you whenever he rubs you in the wrong way or tilts you why don't you take it as an opportunity to spill out some sweetness spill out some love <clears throat> and she really took it as a challenge yes if you carry a vessel full of milk and when you tilt that what spills out is milk and when you are full of the spirit and you are tilted you spill out the sweetness and the love of the spirit when you are full of bitterness and selfishness and discontent when you are tilted that's what you spill out and it is often the disturbing circumstances of life that tell us what we are really full of and here it says Philip went about spilling Jesus Christ speaking about Jesus Christ there was no time for self-pity there was no time for speaking about personal discomfort or suffering and that was possible because he was so much under the control of the Spirit you know the Holy Spirit helps us to endure what God wants us to endure this may sound rather strange we think the power of the Spirit is for achievement but the Bible often speaks of power for endurance turning to Colossians this is what we notice in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11 Paul expresses his prayer for the Colossians and he says may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy it almost sounds like an anticlimax may you be filled with all power and the next thing he says for endurance and patience yes to go through the disturbing circumstances of life without breaking without collapsing going to the breaking point and yet not breaking not because of anything that is within me but because I have the fortifying strengthening comforter the Spirit of God strengthening me and controlling me and that is something the Holy Spirit can do his power can do for us and then you notice in the same chapter Acts 8 and verse 26 an angel of the Lord said to Philip rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza notice the instruction Philip was preaching to hundreds and thousands and having a great time of blessing and the angel of the Lord says the message that came to him was you rise and go to the south and there is the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza and then we are told that is a desert road no other instruction was given suppose he was told you go there and you will meet the great Ethiopian official and you will be the first one to witness to him it would have been easy to obey but not all the instructions are given right in the beginning you are told to do something but you are not told everything and all of a sudden the spirit says I am taking you through the wilderness and you say Lord why the wilderness why this barren experience why all of these situations around me now Philip went obeying the word of the Lord and you notice in verse 29 the spirit said to Philip where is the Holy Spirit he was with him in Samaria in the midst of all those great blessings he was with him as he walked to that road from Jerusalem to Gaza and he was with him in the desert and the spirit with him in that experience in the wilderness and then the spirit says now I'll tell you why I brought you here there is the man to whom I want you to witness and Philip understood now why the Lord brought him to the desert friend sometimes God hides the surprise around the corner he has his streams in the valleys and his springs in the wilderness but when the command comes to you all that the command says is go and there is the wilderness and when you go to the wilderness the Holy Spirit who never leaves who is all the time with us even in such perplexing situations where we don't understand why we are here he is able to lead us and sustain us 
and make us useful and fruitful. Out of him, streams of living water, everywhere, in suffering, in disturbing circumstances, in perplexing situations in the wilderness. And that is what we notice in the case of Philip. Now the last situation, and I call this the domestic situation. There was the difficult situation and there was the depressing situation and now the domestic situation in chapter 21. And this is the last scene in Philip's life and then we see him move out. Acts 21 verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> On the morrow, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. He was not known as Philip the Evangelist before. He began his work just serving at tables in administrative work. And then, somehow, this gift that was in him was discovered. It came to the forefront, and now he is acknowledged as Philip the Evangelist. He was one of the seven, and we stayed with him, Paul uh, Luke says. And he had four unmarried daughters. When a Christian preacher has four unmarried daughters, in India we think the man has already sunk. <laughs> because it's quite a job to get all of them married. And here was a Christian worker, an evangelist, with four unmarried daughters. Now notice what the word says about them. Here is where the significance is. They were unmarried and they prophesied. The implication is they did not remain unmarried because of some accident or some other reason. They were so dedicated to the service of Christ and his church, they were prophetesses and they remained single. Four daughters, all of them consecrated to Christ. What a wonderful testimony. And if that should happen, certainly in his domestic life, in his home life, Philip must have been a spiritual man. And today, my friends, if there are people who fail to manifest the fullness of the Spirit anywhere it is in the home, it is often manifested in prayer meetings, behind the pulpit, and in public occasions, with great noise and with great boisterousness we manifest the power of the Spirit. But when it comes to the home, there is anything but the power of the Spirit. And yet you look at the New Testament, you find Ephesians chapter 5, and you notice Paul says in verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about a series of domestic relationships. The relationship between wives and husbands, between fathers and children. What does it mean? He says, for these relationships in the home, you need the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if there is someone here who says, I am a failure, a very bad failure in my home. I have been irritated, I have been impatient, and I have not manifested a Christian testimony before my children, before my parents, before my husband or my wife. My friend, brother, sister, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to have a testimony in your own home. You need to be under the control and the direction of the Holy Spirit in your own home to face the ordinary relationships in the home. It's not easy. You cannot take even relationships in a home for granted. You need the power of the Spirit to be all that you have to be. And I can imagine as Philip talked to those daughters and as he lived before those daughters, as he related himself to them and to his wife, he manifested the fullness of the Holy Spirit. No wonder those four girls said, we would follow the Lord whom our Father serves. And they were prophetesses. Yes, a testimony in the home. The question is, are you under the control of the Holy Spirit? What is to be done? The Holy Spirit, as someone has said, is a perfect gentleman. He does not come pushing himself into your life. The only condition under which he takes control is when you yield yourself to him and ask him to take control. It doesn't happen automatically. You cannot just say, well, I'll keep on living my life and it will happen automatically. No, deliberately, decisively you have to say, I'm not going to run my life, whether it is in difficult situations or depressing situations or domestic situations, Spirit of God, you take control of me. I'll put myself in your hands. And that is a very decisive surrender. And at that point, the Spirit in you becomes the Spirit 
who flows out of you as streams of living water. In him, a spring of water. Out of him, streams of water. Let us pray. <clears throat> Shall we spend a few moments in silent prayer? If we are conscious of our own failure in human relationships or in the home or in difficulties, let us confess our failure to him and ask the Holy Spirit very definitely to take control of our lives, to strengthen us where we need to be strengthened. <coughs> Lord, you have said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We are a hungry and a thirsty people. We want to be all that you want us to be. We want to do all that you want us to do. And yet we realize that in ourselves we are helpless and powerless. We have failed in trying to run our own lives. We pray that you will take charge of us, our emotions, our attitudes and our whole beings, that we shall be the kind of people you want us to be. We trust you for this. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.